My name is Sinkami Oladeji Olaure. I am um, a general dental practitioner who uh, mainly focuses on um, really dental implants. So that means I still do a little bit of general dentistry. Um, and, but most of my practice is actually confined to um, dental implants. Um, as in, I, love, I love this quote up here. You will never know your limits unless you push yourself towards them. As an athlete and an ex-printer, um, I used to remember my, my times of training where, um, you know, I'll be training in the morning just so that I can try and get into the Olympics. And it, it, was, it was hard graft. And, you know, um, the, the, the preparation that was required um, was immense and it's no different to implant dentistry as well. So for me on a personal level, this quote is very important. Implant dentistry has really undergone a massive journey in the last 10 to 20 years. I remember again back in dental school when implants were really only performed by dental implant um, consultants and um, were really kept out of the general dental practitioner sphere. But now, but now we um, general dental practitioners are really doing, um, doing, um, so just bear with me for a second. I'm just having a bit of a, yeah. So right now, clinicians are upskilling, um, pushing down boundaries, wanting to do more to rehabilitate our patients. And really more and more general dental practitioners are having practices that are restricted to, to implant dentistry. Um, so why, why is this topic really important? Well, it is important because more and more dental implants are being placed worldwide. The global dental implant market is increasing and it's estimated to be currently worth about $5.3434 billion as of 2021. Um, no doubt this has been helped by COVID. And it's thought that it's gonna be worth around $8.69 billion by 2026. And more importantly, because of social media, you know, um, gone are the days where, you know, you could just whack in an implant or just place an implant and not have any real concerns about the final aesthetics. Nowadays, patients demand more from, um, from us as clinicians. So we need to be able to manage those complications should they arise so that we don't end up with unaesthetic results like, like this, um, like this over here or like this over here. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, really important because with increasing social media um, presence, patients are actually demand for inconspicuous, aesthetically pleasing restorations. Um, and why shouldn't they, to be quite honest with you? We've even gone from, you know, conventional dentures right up to, you know, full arch. You know, patients want things that are fixed. And that's not to say that it's not without its own complications. However, you know, patients want something that's fixed and something that works and something where, you know, we can keep the complications to a, to, to a minimum. So the reason why we need to know this is because when it comes to dental implants, you know, right back to 1995, Garber and Bell's actually suggested that it is no longer sufficient to just attach a prosthetic device to an underlying fixture. And soft tissue harmony is actually really important to ensuring patients end up with an aesthetic and functional result. Otherwise, they'll reject the treatment. So in short, we're placing more and more dental implants with more placements. Unfortunately, it's gonna mean more complications. And in the words of Prof Ziv Mazur, if you have no complications, you're simply not placing enough implants. That's to say that complications are inevitable. However, as clinicians, we must and should do our best to minimize these complications. So the objective of, the, of this presentation um, lecture really is to discuss the importance of proper surgical and resource planning in implant dentistry, discuss the complications that can occur with them, dental implants, discuss you know, how to avoid some of the pitfalls and reduce the rate of complications, and discuss some of the current literature around managing peri-implantitis. Literatures will be sort of weaved in and out through the, throughout the whole presentation. I hope to sort of do this by you know, defining what we mean by success and survival. You know, success and survival is a term that's constantly been um, banged around in the dental world, but what did it actually mean? What does it mean when an implant actually fails? 
what are the type of biological failures we can have or non-biological failures? And we'll then go on to um, draw a conclusion and um, have a discussion really. So success and survival, what does it actually mean? Well, implant survival can simply be defined as an implant that remains in place at the time of evaluation, regardless of any you know, signs and symptoms or history of problems. So the important thing to know here is just because an implant is surviving, doesn't mean that it's without complication and doesn't mean that it's a successful implant. Implant success can roughly be defined um, as an implant with no pain or mobility um, and there's you know, no radiolucency around the parent implant areas. And really, Albertson et al. really said that you know, it, there can be no more than 0.2 millimeters of bone loss annually following the first year of loading. Um, that would determine an implant's success. So when it comes to talking about success and survival, the problem really is we can't, we don't really apply this to natural teeth. Natural teeth is often described in the literature as clinical success or failure, not from an implant point of view, but from a set of clinical parameters perspective. So for example, bleeding and probing, um, degree of mobility, et cetera. But even then we don't say this tooth is successful or this tooth is, 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 has, has failed. Instead, we deal with conditions of a tooth. At, in 2007, um, a modified James Mish health scale was actually created and approved. And this described the conditions of implant success, survival, and failure. The survival conditions for implants really may have two different categories. Satisfactory survival, which describes an implant with less than ideal conditions, yet it doesn't actually require any clinical management. Or compromised survival, which are really implants that have less than ideal conditions and require clinical treatments to reduce the risk of implant failure. So let's talk about implant failure. It's simply a term used for implants that require the removal or have already been lost. In terms of success, implant success, it's a term which we can be used to describe ideal clinical conditions. And really we should include a time period of at least 12 months for implants that serve as the prosthetic abutments. The term early implant success is, is suggested to span for about one to three years. So when you're speaking to your patients and you're saying that my success rate is X, really you should give a time period and a descriptive um, period to um, communicate effectively to your patients. So I would say something like my early implant success is um, you know 98%, that is implants have lasted up to three years. Now, intermediate implant success is up to seven years, about 95%. And my long-term implant success is about 98% for anything that's lasted more than seven years. I'm not saying that's those are my success rates. I'm just simply illustrating the point that the, these are terms we should be using to um, explain to our patients what our success rates are. So question, I mean, would you say this is success? or this is an implant that survived or just a mere complication? I mean, I mean, just a thought. Here we can see an implant which has been placed um, at a really interesting angle. And you tend to, again, you tend to find this more common with immediate placements. And actually the lower left four tooth, so this tooth over here has actually devitalized. So it's caused further complication to the tooth in front of it. I guess that's one way to get an extra implant out of your patients. Is this success, survival, or another mere complication? I'll leave you guys to ponder on that. You can see where an implant has been placed in the left maxillary region, and it has migrated into the sinus and has caused chronic um, 
I imagine sinusitis, complete obstruction of the actual sinus and paranasal um, cavities. Abson et al. 1986 actually stated that um, implant success really is implants that are non-mobile. They, there's no radiographic evidence of peri-implant radiolucency. The bone loss is less than 1.2 millimeters in the first year and less than 0.2 millimeters in, a, in subsequent years. So really we should be measuring our bone um, levels at review appointments. It should really be looking at reviewing our patients at least once a year to two years. And of course, no persistent pain, discomfort or infection. The Parameter which was in the parameter which was constructed in 2007 um, is highlighted here. We have success, which is optimal health. And the key features really to understand is that there's no pain or tenderness and function. There's no mobility. Again, the radiographic bone loss from the initial surgery is less than two millimeters and there's no exudate um, history. So there's no pass or discharge at all. Satisfactory survival um, is really um, how it really has all the features of the first one, which is success, optimal health. Um, but there's an acceptable bone loss of two to four millimeters. I mean, I don't know how different people feel about that. For some clinicians, that's unacceptable. And we need to identify why they're losing bone. Then we have compromised survival. This may basically have be, this is implants which may have sensitivity, sensitivity or pain on function and or there's radiographic bone loss, which is more than four millimeters, but less than half of the actual implant body. Um, the probing depth is usually around seven, is more than seven millimeters to constitute compromised survival, and there may be history of extra dates. In this situation, we actually definitely need to intervene because otherwise you will end up with implant failure, which would be the loss of the actual implant itself. I know some clinicians would actually open, open up the, um, open up the site and do an open debridement procedure and graph the area. And then of course we have number four, which is complete failure. Well, this is really where the radiographic bone loss is more than half of the length of the actual implant. And sometimes, well, a lot of the time you get uncontrolled extra dates. In some cases, um, the implant actually just exfoliates itself. So is this success or failure or complication. I can tell this is one of my cases, one of my early cases. Um, the implant is, um, has really good um, bone around it. There's no exposures of threads. Well, we've got significant recession. And the reason, part of the reason why this have happened is because there was no respect for the, um, for, for the soft tissue. How about this? The, you know, nowadays full arches become fashionable. Is this success or failure? The problem areas here are really, there's lack of keratinized tissue around here. There's lack of keratinized tissue around, around here. The implants are exposed. Um, and you can see the exposed threads present. And essentially these implants are actually failing. So again, I ask you, is this implant success or or, or failure. So let's talk about what can actually go wrong. I think strategy and planning is the most important aspect when it comes to surgical dentistry. You know, we've, I, th I, I personally feel, and these are my personal opinions, we have swapped careful and methodical planning for quickness and agility in its totality without the clear respect and understanding that agility is not possible without planning. Ladies and gentlemen, planning is everything. And it begins right from the very start, from when the patient walks through the door, before, you even, before they even say, I want an implant. You want to be looking at the patient, look at the gait, look at their hands, look at their manual dexterity, look at how, how tightly they're gripping that door handle. Do they have the dexterity to look after the expensive and complicated treatment you're going to provide for them in terms of implants? Do they have the commitment to your treatment? You know, there's nothing worse than spending um, hours on end rehabilitating our patients. 
and then they have perimplantitis because they just simply can't be bothered to brush their teeth or they smoke fifth and all this fifth day a day. More importantly, do they actually want an implant? Poor planning, ladies and gentlemen, can actually result in patients wanting something that's on the right and us delivering something that's on the left. So in this situation, something like this, I'll, I've recently got into grills, which is why I put this picture up. I think it's fantastic, but you can see what's clearly wrong with the image on the left. The gums are puffy, they look red. Um, it just doesn't look healthy at all. And I, I've seen on Facebook, on Instagram, clinicians placing implants in patient's mouth where the rest is falling to bits. The rest of the intention is falling to bits. So in this case, hello gum disease. So what are the type of complications we can have? We can have surgical complications, biological complications, mechanical complications, aesthetic complications, which I showed you earlier on, um, complications related to augmented augmentation procedures, and complications relating to loading protocols. In terms of the prevalence of complications, well, Perjason et al. 2007 actually noted that the common complications are fractured crowns, 13.2% after five years, loose screw access hole restorations, basically mainly complications that's related to the prosthetic elements. And in terms of biological complications or mechanical complications in terms of the implants, we've got fracture of the implants, which is, thank goodness, quite rare these days, especially when you have a um, quite a world and world-renowned implant system like Norris Medical or any other competitors out there, you know, they, the, the, the material which the implant is made from is so important. Biological complications such as perimplantitis and soft tissue lesions is actually sits around 8.6%. And so therefore understanding this, we can manage the complications arising before we actually put blade to um, the scalpel into the patient's um, ginger vein before we make our cut. Zitzman and Berglunder actually saw that peri-implant mucositis is the most common complications in terms of biological complications, somewhere around the 50%. Um, and biological failures were seen as relatively low in general terms at 7.7%, which was seen by Esposito et al. And risk factors for these are, you know, smoking, diabetes, and pre previous history of um, periodontitis. So I want you to start thinking, if a patient has periodontal disease, should we be doing full arch? Just a question. In terms of surgical complications, these are your usual hemorrhage and hematoma. So this is something which we have done to the patients because of poor planning. You know, this is where I want to, I want to start thinking about, you know, guided surgery, for example, especially when we're working in the lower anterior region, we want to place multiple implants, or you've got this sublingual artery just, just right there. Neurosensory disturbances, you know, sometimes um, when, we do, when we don't use guides or when we try to go for immediate placements, we tend to, um, we can accidentally place our implants right by the mental nerve, which causes um, hyposthesia or hypesthesia. We know that in about 28% of cases, you actually have an anterior loop of the mental nerve. So again, when you have your CT scan, which everyone should be doing before you have your, uh, before you place your implants, you can actually look for this, um, for, for whether your patient has an anterior loop. Uh, but of course, the most common cause for neurosensory disturbance is really lateral nerve reposition procedure. I, it's not something which I do or have the skill set to do. And it's not something which I would personally be embarking on, but some clinicians do do it. My, the, by and large, the most com common common implant um, surgical complications, and I've put this under surgical complications, is really implant malpositioning. We've got, that, and that can be due to poor planning, lack of surgical skills, poor communication between surgeons and restorative dentists. So sometimes we have cases where a surgeon will place the implant and someone else will restore. Um, adjacent, damage to adjacent teeth, compromised aesthetics, and soft tissue and bone dis dehiscence. And by far, that is the most common um, complications that can arise, in my opinion. So let's look at some malpositioned implants. 
If we look here, we can see that the, um, the implant in this patient's jaw is slightly too mesial and the angulation's slightly off, but it's still restorable. How about this? This is, again, one of mine. Um, this is a case where we went for immediate, immediate placement, and you can just see how the implant just drifted um, distally um, with our osteotomy. And again, this is, this is a complication that can easily happen. And how about this? Luckily, this isn't one of mine. Um, we have a, um, an implant that was placed um, just pre-COVID and about a year later, before it's even been restored, we've already got um, significant, quite significant bone loss. With this, would you be keen to try and restore this, this case? If it's the restorative dentist restoring this case, would they be keen to, quite, to, to restore this case? You know, who takes the overall burden of responsibility for this case? And how about this? This is another um, placement um, where it's, again, it's drifted measly. Um, whilst, you know, the vertical um, angulation is, is pretty good, the placement is, is incorrect. And so therefore there's no way you can restore that. In, in, in this case, the implants actually have to be um, explanted. And what about this? Mispositioned implants. I, again, this is not one of mine. However, I think the surgeon on that day was having a really, really bad day. And we all had them. It's normal. I just wanted to note, um, you know, the periapical lesion around the upper left um, for tooth as well. Um, just, just a point. And what about this? I showed you an early case where a, um, an, uh, an implant which has been placed um, too close to the roots actually caused um, periapical collision associated with that root in the lower jaw. This is um, a case which the periapical collision hasn't started yet, but you can clearly see that this is completely the wrong angle. And again, you know, the surgeon was having a really bad day on that day, I would imagine. And again, what about this? So you can see that mispositioning or malposition of implants is quite a common complication, but why do they happen? Poor planning, lack of surgical guide, lack of appreciation for the complexity that arises with going immediate versus say early or delayed placements, which is why continuous education is really important. And how about this? This is um, essentially a, a a bunch of implants that have been placed um, at different time points, I would imagine. And with one of them I've circled, you have a periapical lesion um, associated with um, the upper right too. I did not place these implants. However, I was the one who ended up having to um, surgically ex um, explant them. I show you these cases, not from a judgmental perspective, but from a perspective of reflection and to encourage the pursuit of mastery in implant dentistry, because do you know what? Our patients deserve it and we, we owe it to ourselves as well as clinicians. And the reason is because sometimes we ourselves can end up causing hydrogenic damage to our patients when delivering care. We know that, you know, mispositioned implants and natural great grafting techniques can often result from implants being placed too, too close together or close to neighboring um, teeth that do not al actually allow for adequate spaces for good oral hygiene. So not even in terms of um, we've malpositioned the implants from a restorative point of view, but how is the patient actually going to clean around the implants? In my opinion, this becomes even more important in large cases. And again, I've seen um, loads and loads of um, cases on Facebook where you know, the inter-implant distance just is not sufficient. Implants really should be placed in the correct um, 3D, uh, I mean 4D positioning. And this is something which I learned from Dr. Hassan Magari um, as part of the beard course. And they need to have sufficient bone volume. 
with a minimum of 1.5 millimeters surrounding the industrious portion of the implant. The reason why I say 4D position is really because we sometimes we concentrate too heavily on the mesodistal and the buccal lingual, and even sometimes the verticals so are how deep they go, but we never really concentrate on the actual angulation, which is which can result in some of the issues which I've pointed out already. So how deep is deep? Well, really implants should be placed in the correct vertical um, dimension. I thought this is a lovely section from this trimming guide from the ITI. I think um, trim, the trimming guide eight or, or, or seven, I can't quite remember. So, you know, some implants say they never treat periodontal compromised patients. Now I'm not advocating treating or not treating them. I'm merely saying that if we select the correct implants, say for example, tissue level, I, I'm, um, I know Norris Medical do um, a tissue level implants, which is fantastic for these sorts of situations. And we place them in the correct 4D orientation, which should in theory be fine. For, provided and provides it is that they, there's a very strict periodontal regimen in place. So you need to work with your hygienist. You can see where the implant has been placed too deeply, the patient, and because the clinician hasn't actually measured the thickness of the soft tissue. So the patients are actually unable to clean around the, the, the implant and they get pocketing. So deep, uh, I would love to say, you know, it's as deep as you make it, but really you need to be thinking two to three millimeters from your future gingival line. And that would be ideal. And the reason be, is because the risk of mucositis involving into implantitis, in particularly in susceptible patients, is quite high. Modified plaque index and gingival index and you know, IL, IL 1 beta concentration has been seen to be significantly higher in patients who have really deep um, implants, possibly and likely due to the difficulty in cleaning. In these situations, regular hygiene visits with possible removal of the crown and submucosal clean is essential. As I said, you know, there's a risk of mucositis really involving interperi implantitis in clinical situations such as this. And this was seen uh, by Berglunde uh, et al. in 2018. Obviously, if the patient has no adjacent teeth, then cleaning might be slightly easier. But I think our aim really is to place the implant in the correct 4D positioning. How about something like this? Let's be friends. This implant is far too close to the um, upper left three in this situation. So let's talk about biological complications. Biological complications can um, be a result of inflammation and proliferation of the actual peri-implant soft tissue. And it's usually plaque induced. It's quite common where you have loose implant abutments or where you have um, a bottom and crown connection, which is loose, or where you have excessive cement, um, which has gone on the on, um, subgingively and has not been cleaned out. So a really good rule of thumb is to actually take um, a, a PA um, of your um, cemented implant restorations to see if you've got any, if you've left the cement behind. Another biological complication is really the hissance and recession. And that's usually due to soft and hard tissue deficiency or lack of respect for the soft tissue. You know, there's a new coin being batted around, which is soft tissue is the, is the, is the issue. And I think it's so important to pay penance to, to that. But another biological complication is really peri-implantitis and progressive bone loss which would obviously result in ultimate implant loss or failure. So this is a fantastic, fantastic sur surgical procedure, which is carried out by Dr. Hassan Magari. Uh, it's based up in Leeds, if anyone wants to uh, meet him, really nice chap. Um, but he was kind enough to lend me th this photo of his Instagram page. And the reason is this clearly demonstrates just the different levels of soft tissue you, you have around your implants. In health, a color of peri-implant soft tissue is formed around the implant abutment. And it really consists of an epithelial component and a connective tissue component. The epithelial com components can, is usually you know, keratinized or epithelium, or in some cases, non-keratinized junctional epithelium. 
and the epithelium is separated from your from the peri-implant marginal bone. So if you imagine you have your bone, then you have your um, you have your connective tissue, and that's what separates it from the epithelium. And the connective tissue is usually one to one point five millimeters in general terms. And so the coronal apical dimension of the junction epithelium is around two two millimeters. So two plus one point five is really three point five. So that's really what forms your biological wave. And it's really important to, 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 to pay attention to this because if you invade it, you will get recession in patients with um, thin biotype um, that I, if you have, um, if you have unpolished um, um, ceramic or zirconia underneath, and you invade this, you will, you will have issues. Um, you know, in health, there's no clinical signs of inflammation, no bleeding or probing, no separation. The important thing to know about that slide is really like your connective tissue and your junction epithelium actually form a nice um, tight um, seal for you to protect your implant from the assault of the oral environment and bugs. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is the peri-implants, tissue and dental implants. Before, before we need to do that, we need to understand what is actually health. In health, there is equilibrium between the bacterial challenge and the host response. If you speak to um, most periodon periodontists, this is what they'll tell you. Once your implants exposed to the oral cavity, i.e. the threads, microorganisms will rapidly colonize that, the transmucosal parts of the implant and abutment. The peri-implant soft tissue really may be considered as a barrier that protects the zone of osteointegration from factors that are released from the bacterial plaque and the oral cavity. And this is part, part of the reason why some clinicians prefer tissue level implants. Robert Retti loves tissue level implants, uh, particularly for the posterior regions, because he believes that you are shifting the platform away from the bone and slightly higher up. So you don't actually disturb the, 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 the connection between the bone and the threads of the implants. Pair implant infections are caused when an imbalance actually exists between the bacterial microbiofilm and the actual, um, uh, the actual host defense. And this can result in um, inflammatory processes, which will result in pair implant mucositis, which is inflammation for peri, implantitis, which is bone loss. So I want to present to you some examples. You know, there's some serious lack of keratinized tissue in, in this particular patient, uh, which has obviously affected the patient's ability to actually perform adequate um, oral hygiene. In some cases, there is um, lack of inter-implant distance, which is a confounding factor. And as a result, the patient has peri-implantitis around the Bit which I've circled red. So let's talk about the actual biofilms. Well, the cause and the effects of the relationship between the biofilm formation at implants and the implant mucositis has been demonstrated in humans um, early, even earlier than um, Ponterio 94 and Savi 2012. We know that when oral hygiene was discontinued in order to allow undisturbed plaque accumulation, there were clinical signs of peri-implant inflammation, so bleeding and probing. And this was apparent just within the first few days, and it resolved when oral hygiene was reinstated. The important thing to know is that the composition of the peri-implant biofilms associated with the inflammation may actually lead to peri-implantitis in susceptible hosts. Therefore, patients with untreated periodontal disease residual deep pockets and or poor oral hygiene are at greater risk for the development of peri-implantitis. And if you're in the UK, this can end up leading to litigation. So what do you think of this situation? Again, this is a really good image I got from um, the ITI um, treatment guide. You know, my question really is whose fault is this? Is this the surgeon's fault? Is it the res restorative dentist's fault? Are they one and the same? Or is it a patient's fault? Well, one thing to know is that there's a lack of keratinized tissue. And I keep 
banging on about this because um, it's really important for the comfort of the patients. If the patients finds it painful to clean around the implants, they simply won't clean. Biofilms are associated with peri-implantitis and peri-mucositis have been studied. And it's been seen that the bacteria is actually similar um, to that that's found in chronic periodontitis with a mix of anaerobic inf infection, which is dominated by gram-negative bacteria. It has also been seen that you have um, enteric rods, yeast, and microorganisms that are associated with extra oral infections, such as Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis. The bacteria associated with peri-implant mucositis are similar to that um, of peri-implantitis peri that was seen by Casado et al. 2011. This suggests that submucosal plaque formation and development of peri-implant mucositis are the precursors to peri-implantitis. So in this situation, you can see where there's been complete destruction of the, of, of the bone around your implant. And you can again see that it's just gonna be very difficult for the patient to clean. In, in the um, left picture, so um, you can see the, the deepness of the actual pocket, which is measuring around um, seven millimeters. Again, signifying bone loss. And then what about this? You know, this is a, an implant which is placed um, pre-COVID loaded, looks fine. And then all of a sudden patient actually lost all of the bones around the implants. Is it because of the cantilever of the crown? Again, something that's really important to adequate oral hygiene. Iatrogenic risk factors for peri-implantitis, which is again, something which we contribute to include inadequate prosthesis, something that's poor fitting or, and, or something that's you know, just poor sitting. This is the role that you know, we think, or I think um, prosthetics have on peri-implant infection. If something's over contoured or poorly designed, that will actually prevent in, uh, um, adequate access for oral hygiene procedures, which may lead to peri-implant infection in susceptible patients. And this has been seen by Sarah and Strom 2009. Inadequate fit of the abutments or the prosthesis or in incorrect seat on the cemented prosthesis, again, will lead to the presence of submucosal um, excess lutein cement being present, which will cause bacteria accumulation and result in clinical inflammation and peri implant infection. It, it has been documented that rough surface implants, such as um, titanium plasma spray, so TPS, are more likely to develop peri-implantitis than micro rough implant surfaces if the implant surface becomes exposed to the oral cavity. And this was seen by Lang et al, um, 2011. And again, this is why your implant surface and understanding what your implant, how your implant is actually made is so important. And implant selection is important for the, for, 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 for the patients. Once initiated the progression and how quickly, you know, peri-implant infection um, occurs is really a combination of the host or hygiene or lack of and the patient's susceptibility. Paitelli et al. 1995 actually observed that hydroxyapatite coated implants were thick coating likely to develop peri-implantitis. So this is a this was a quite an interesting case which I found. Um, this patient had two implants placed in the lower anterior region and um, again, not by myself, um, but this was pre-COVID, post-COVID, she came back and she'd completely lost um, pretty much all the bone around it. And as a result of taking the, the, the implants out, we've got quite significant recession and quite, of course, significant bone loss around the upper left lateral incisor as well. So how do we get from there to there? From good bone to now mobile, um, lower left um, two. And this is what I mean by the hydrogenic damage, which we could potentially cause to our patients. P.S. She's also a quite heavy smoker. Again, this is another case. Um, I didn't actually place the implants, which I've circled. Um, I did, however, do the internal sinus lift for this particular patient. Um, as you can see, you can see there next to the um, last standing molar. But again, you can see the um, exfoliation, almost exfoliation of that implant. 
Sometimes, you know, the biology of the patient results in implantitis, mainly due to, you know, the presence of cement subgingively, which is something which I've alluded to already. So please, if you are going to go cement, um, cement, cemented, I don't, unless I absolutely have to, please, please, please clean the cements out. Otherwise, you're doing your patients a disservice. What about, you know, the concept of soft tissue is an issue? Well, the, min the presence of a minimum amount of keratinized mucosa is actually controversial, and it's something that's often debated. Several researchers have found that insufficient keratinized mucosa may be correlated with plaque accumulation, bleeding or probing, discomfort when brushing, mucosal recession, and peri-implant mucositis. And this was seen by Bori and et al. in 2008, and various other authors as well. More, more recently, Rosesso um, et al. 2016. However, other researchers were unable to find similar findings. Um, you know, Fish et al. 2015. The important thing to note here really is there may have been, you know, some flaws in the design of the study. Um, some have even suggested that keratinized mucosa may not be essential in the presence of scrupulous oral hygiene and rigorous compliance with a professional maintenance regime. And that's the thing to um, note. You know, we're not saying that, or I'm not saying that, um, you know, you definitely need to have keratinized mucosa, but if you, but if you, if you do, it helps. If you don't, you sure then need to make sure that your patient's oral hygiene is perfect. And let's be honest, my question to you really is, how many of your patients actually have extremely rigorous regimen? I mean, we as dentists don't. So why would we expect this of our patients? And so therefore, should we actually be taking the risk? Should we be augmenting these sites that have lack of keratinized mucosa? Because really we need only about two millimeters. This is actually a topic that I looked at for my MSc um, dissertation, where I did a systematic review of randomized controlled trials for augmentation versus no augmentation. My conclusion was that actually most randomized control trials are flawed and underpowered. And so therefore it's difficult to conclude for sure cause and effect, i.e. lack of keratinized tissue causes perimplantitis. But I think it's more to do with the oral hygiene practice. And that was certainly my final conclusion. And here you can see just how inflamed that last standing uh, molar is um, around the implants. And there's very deep pocketing there. You can see in, in terms of the central, there's just lack of, uh, um, of keratinized uh, mucosa, which is quite movable, which becomes even more important when you're doing grafting because your grafting, your graft will fail if you do not um, provide, um, if, if, you, if your mucosa is moving around your implants or around your graft. Um, and of course, in this situation, it's led to implant failure. What about systemic conditions? Well, we know that there's a bi-directional relationship um, that exists between um, smoking and periodontal disease and diabetes and periodontal disease. So we need to be mindful of this and we need to be thinking case selection. And if we are going to place implants in patients who have um, had pre-existing um, pre gum disease, we need to be putting them on a very strict regimen. Sometimes we can have hardware complications, which actually presents as biological complications. You know, the presence of draining sinus is observable when there is peri-implant infection that drains through the actual peri-implant mucosa. A draining sinus may actually be associated with either mucositis or implantitis. And so therefore you need to take an extra, you need to assess your patients. You know, just because they have a drain sinus doesn't necessarily mean that they've got bone loss. So the extra will tell you that. Of course, this might be slightly more difficult if you have um, grafted the whole site with xenograft. And because sometimes you don't really see um, resorption with xenograft. Um, anyways, um, the cause may be biological, so plaque related or hardware related, which is, you know, such as loose abutments or screws um, or screw fractures or incorrect prosthesis um, seating or inadequate seating, really. Therefore, careful assessment is needed. What about non plaque related biological complications? Well, sometimes, despite our best efforts, we just have, we do get complete loss of osseointegration integration and includes overloading. Usually with these, there's no, there's no signs of peri implant infection. 
And the radiograph will show a narrow radiolucent area surrounded the entire endosseous portion of the actual implant. This is in contrast to the actual radiographic bone loss pattern of regressive crescent bone loss that's seen in peri-implantitis. Because remember, that's an inflammatory process. So you tend to get sort of like a more like a cr cr um, crescent um, 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 resorption. It is thought that late failure of osseointegrated implants can be caused by a combination of poor bone quality, mechanical trauma to, to the bone, overloading. And it's actually suggested that the load has, in terms of overloading, it's suggesting that the load has actually exceeded the capacity of the host bone, and therefore the osseointegration is completely lost. This is um, much a high, this is a high risk in patients with parafunctional habits such as grinding or clenching. Albuxin et al. 2013 actually suggested that, you know, this may be due to a foreign body reaction. However, there's no cohesive or conclusive scientific evidence to support this claim. Um, sometimes we have non-plaque related oral mucosa disorders such as lichen planus or um, which is an inflammatory uh, mucocutaneous condition that often manifests itself um, intraorally, and it can affect it can affect around the implant um, mucosa, but there is no um, evidence to suggest that you get bone loss around your implants with, with this condition. Um, sometimes we can actually have carcinomas or tumors around our implants, which presents as an exophytic mass, and it's important to or or or, or erosions. It's important to um, look out for these. Peripheral giant cell granulum is another um, an, is another thing that can occur around our implants, which is a really a benign reactive exophytic lesion. We don't know what causes it, um, but a biopsy and a histological examination is absolutely essential, especially to rule out um, carcinomas. And of course, we can have um, implants associated with bisphosphonates, which can cause osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, branch or M branch or whatever the new term is. And again, you know, we know that there's a lower risk in patients who are on oral bisphosphonates compared to IV bisphosphonates. So you, again, you want to be asking your patient, patients um, what um, their bisphosphonates um, history is. Particularly in the UK, GPs love prescribing every single um, elderly patient bisphosphonates nowadays. So it sometimes could be a real headache. So sometimes you think, oh, well, I placed an implant five years ago before this patient was on bisphosphonates, but I can tell you that sometimes patients can still develop um, branch or m branch around very well successfully also integrated implants. And sometimes our patients can have hypersensitivity reactions. And this is where we need to be thinking about, um, you know, doing um, dermal um, sensitivity testing. So, you know, patients have often sometimes report allergy, allergies to um, titanium. Um, Cobochrome is another one. So you need to be making sure that your implant isn't cobochrome, it's actually titanium before you place it in, in your patients. And you need to be making sure that, you know, you consider alternatives such as um, ceramic or zirconia implants. So how do we manage them? So, well, to be quite honest with you, a thorough clinical examination is essential, even before teeth are extracted, before we even place our implants, okay? But let's say you've placed your implants and, you know, the patient has perimicositis or, um, or perimplantitis. What do we do? Well, the treatment of peri-implant mucositis is, is a reversible condition. condition. Um, the thorough removal of the, you know, super and sub uh, mucosal in peri-implant biofilm in combination with reinforcement of self-performed oral hygiene is key. You can go, you can go for non-surgical mechanical removal of the calculus and biofilms um, using hand curettes or ultrasonic devices with plastic carbon fiber or titanium tips. But you need to be mindful that this can actually scratch your implant surfaces. The peri-implant biofilms can also be removed using air abrasive devices, um, Rubrium, YAG lasers, photodynamic therapies, and rubber polishing cups as well. 
But whatever you do, you need to choose a method that minimizes damage to the surface of the transmucosa parts of the prosthesis or the implants, because that's how you're going to roughen, because otherwise you're going to roughen the surface of the implants and you're going to get more bacteria um, ad adhesion. Antiseptics such as chlorhexidine solution gel can be used as an adjunct to mechanical debridements. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to actually tell you that really implantology without periodontology is like yin without yang. And I love this concept, which was um, developed by, in my opinion, um, well, by WNH. And actually they've, um, they've brought out a really lovely um, peak tip, uh, which you can use with your ultrasonic devices, um, which um, causes less scratch, um, no scratching, and no rubbing off onto your implant surfaces. So that's, it's a really good uh, device to actually use for, to, for, for your, for your pair implant type, for your implant patients. And actually I would advocate that every hygienist should be using these. So we know that paramucositis is reversible. So really the use of, you know, some, some people give their patients um, antibiotics. It's not really justified to be honest. And that was seen by Holstrom in 2012. The, you know, sometimes you might you need to modify the margins of your actual restoration. So sometimes you need to actually take off your restorations, stick a healing department on and modify the, the surface because that might be contributing to the peri-implant mycositis. And we can see how it's resolved here. Peri-implantitis, um, once diagnosed, it is actually important to place an anti-infective treatment protocol in place because if it's left untreated, you will get progression of your bone loss and you will get um, the loss of your implants if this is not dealt with. The primary goal really is to reestablish healthy peri-implant tissue, which requires a cause-related treatment approach. So you need to identify all the causes and resolve it and to prevent secondary disease, um, infection as well. The secondary goal really is um, bone regeneration. So some people just go straight in without thorough debridement or identifying what the initial cause is um, and graft the area, you graft and refill, okay? So you need to identify the cause um, and then consider your secondary goal, which would be to graft the area if possible at all. And many different approaches have been reported in literature. However, it's still unknown which is the most effective and this was seen by Exposito et al. 2012. So with your peri-implant titers, your treatment phase really should be pre-treatment. Um, you should have pre-treatment phase, which is thorough assessment of your peri-implant soft tissue, bone levels and prosthesis in order to make a diagnosis and to establish the cause of your infection. Look at your PAs to determine the extent of the bone loss and whether it's even worth grafting this. I mean, if you've got 70% bone loss, you might decide to actually just explant the actual implant itself. Identify any hardware or technical complication that may manifest itself as biological complications. So do you have a loose abutment, for example? Try and reduce the risk of your peri-implant infection by making sure that your patients actually improve their oral hygiene um, or their um, use of tobacco is reduced or that you've managed to generalize periodontal disease before you've even placed your implants. What else could we do? Well, you could remove your screw retain prosthesis and that will actually allow you to fully assess your, um, your, your implant components. I know Rob has seen, Rob Rett has seen over the years that um, gold abutments tend to actually wear. So you always have um, looseness of your abutment within your actual implants because gold is soft material, let's be honest. So it might mean that you need to modify your, your, your prosthesis. Um, the removal may also uh, improve the access to the implant services for really subsequent debridement. So the implant dentist really needs to work with their hygienist. In terms of non-surgical debridement, the aim is, as I said, to remove submucosal calculus and biofilm on the contaminated implant surfaces. And again, curettes or sonic um, instruments with carbon fibers or plastic tips. Um, Abrasive devices such as sodium bicarbonate or glycine powder, laser therapy, antiseptics, and local, not systemic, but local antimicrobial um, delivery systems can actually be used, or in some cases, I guess, systemic antimicrobials in conjunction with non-surgical debridement. 
So you don't just give your patients antibiotics thinking it's going to go away. You need to use it with um, sparingly and with um, surgical debridements as well. Or, or sorry, surgical or and non-surgical debridements. The most favorable outcome at the implants without advanced bone loss and without deep pre-implant probing death is what you're looking for. So once you've done all of that, you then need to go for early reassessment. So at three months, you need, or once two months, you need to reassess your patients and see if this has worked. The patient really should be provided with regular supportive care and monitoring, okay? And because then you can end up having results, fantastic results like this, where, you know, yes, you've got recession um, of the ginger V, but it means that the patient can actually clean better. If successful, there's persist, if unsuccessful, and there is persistent separation, deep probing depth with bleeding and probing, you may need to consider the surgical intervention, which will be open flap deprivement, um, open flap deprivement with regenerative approach or resective approach, which basically means removing all the, some of the threads, well, the threads up to your, your bone on your actual implants. All surgical protocols include elevation of the full thickness mucoparousal flap, of course, followed by the removal of the peri-implant inflammatory granulation tissue to enable you to adequately access and decontaminate the surface. And again, the contamination protocol is the same as I've already explained. And in some cases, you want to do a, an implant, implantoplasty, which is basically to remove the threads. Here you can see a... Um, titanium wire brush which has been used to actually clean the implant surface and this will later be grafted uh, so to clean the implant surface and this will later be grafted um, and you know th there is some studies out there which show really good success rates um, and again this is just um, demonstrating what I've already um, spoken about what you want after is, is, is in terms of outcome is reduced periodontal probing depth reduce bleeding and probing, um, but you need to be mindful that you're probably going to get recession, especially in patients with really thin biotypes. In terms of resective approach, again, you know, the aim is to reduce the pocket size um, and really um, remove the alveolar bone peaks surrounding the peri-implants defect. Um, once the implant surface is actually been contaminated, the flap needs to be repositioned apically, resulting in the significant tissue recession and exposure to the implant surface, which your patients could then clean later. The trouble with using carbide and diamond burrs to um, really smooth the surface of the implant is that, is that you know, Cheng et al. saw that this may actually compromise the strength of your implants, resulting in increased risk of peri implant fracture. And, you know, sometimes, regardless of what you do, you just have to remove your implants. And it says I have, to, I have had to do that recently with some of the cases which I showed you earlier. The, the thing to note is that when you are doing this, the implant needs to be removed in a really conservative manner. So use your implant removal kit. This, unfortunately, only works for um, tapered implants, okay? And... Also, it becomes increasingly difficult if your implants are a really awkward angle to remove. So sometimes you're unable to do this, you need to use piezo, um, but trying to preserve as much of the bone as possible. And for goodness sake, please avoid trefining, uh, avoid trefining due to excessive bone removal. In this case, all we really did was just use our forceps, extraction forceps, and it came out. So in conclusion, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Um, this is something which um, was taught to me as a, as a, as a, as a child um, in school, and this is something which I still apply today to my practice. You know, that means you need to be going through your uh, patient examination, looking at the thick, whether they have a thick or thin biotype, looking at their smile line, you know, deciding whether you're going for immediate placement, deciding whether you're going to go guided or not. You need to make all those decisions at an early stage. The implant system you decide to use only helps you to a point, and it's common for many clinicians to blame the implant system rather than addressing their own surgical and resortive planning and execution. Ask yourself what we can do to reduce the risk for the patients. So what can I do as a clinician? That might mean I go on a few more courses to learn how to do really good grafting. 
Make a problem list. This is something which I learned from um, Professor Proof from the Bird um, Academy. Problem lists are key. When you've examined your patients and you've got your photos in front of you of a cup of tea, highlight what are the problem areas which the patient themselves present with and what your solutions are for managing those. Thank you very much um, to Norris Medical for the opportunity to um, talk to you today about this. And thank you so much for giving up your time. And thank you to my mentors. You know who you are. And as I said, planning after the event, especially in the UK, is just pure suicide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. It was fantastic. And uh, whoa, amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, if you all want to unmute yourselves, um, because there aren't, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to, to ask. No, okay, I guess that was quite clear. Oh, okay. So, Yeshari is saying that he recently heard about antibiotic coated implants. That's interesting. Um, how, how do they work? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I've never heard of them personally. Um, he's asking how they work, that he's not terribly convinced that they can reduce peri-implantitis. Um, I think there's, there's something to be said for optimizing our patients. You know, if we have a patient who is, who has a predisposition to peri-implantitis and we've made a decision to place an implant, we need to optimize them. Personally, I mean, I don't see how uh, an implant coated with antibiotics, um, which is um, stable, is going to promote um, or reduce peri-implantitis. Because if we remember, peri-implantitis occurs really after we've placed the implants. So you've placed the implant, and what's the release mechanism for these antibiotics? I, I, I don't personally buy it. I think it's just, a, a, I think it would just be a gimmick. And also like, what would be the concentration of the antibiotic present on these implant surfaces? I don't know. But, so good question. How do we clinically recognize ailing and failing, failing implants? Well, if you remember back to um, Abson's um, criteria, you need to check whether the patient has, um, when you get your patient back in, you need to see whether there's any bleeding or probing. I don't mean, you know, just um, bleeding to probing on pressure. I mean, bleeding to really like pro probing, which is, which is an indication of inflammation. Is there any separation? If there's separation of pus coming from the suck from the um, from the implant area, then that's suggesting that there's something going on. Then have a look at your actual um, um, radiograph as well. Is there bone loss compared to? Um, is there more bone loss compared to the um, X-ray you took, say, a year, two years, three years ago? Look at that. Compare. If you you know when when we're expecting about, we're expecting less than, um, I think 0.2 millimeters of bone loss, less than 0.2 millimeters per year following the implant placements. So if it's more, then, you know, you probably have perimplantitis or a failing implant. So you need to jump in and, and, and address it. And sometimes it might mean that you have to be quite aggressive with, with, your, with your management protocol. How does their management differ? Depending on 
if you have a failed implant, I, you know, different people have different thresholds for what constitutes a failed implant. Some people say, if there's bone loss around the implant, I'm taking it out, or I'm giving the patient the option. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take it out. I'm not going to mess around with, you know, trying to graft the area, etc. In which case, you might just decide to explant. It, but generally speaking, if you have more than 50% or loss of bone around your implant, then you probably want to explant that implant and maybe think about grafting it um, after you've cleaned out a socket to try and preserve as much bone as possible. Um, but you need to obviously let your patient know that they might need further augmentation if you decide to place a, a new implant later on. If the implant is failing, and it's less than 50%, then you might want to think about periodontal management. So refer your patient to a periodontologist and they might decide to go uh, non, um, non-surgical initially, improve the patient's oral hygiene and get really get a patient um, cleaning. And if they are thinking surgically, they might decide to you know, do an open debridement like you would with perio patients or you might decide to actually resect and remove the um, threads of the implant up to the level of the bone. So those, those, those are some things you can actually do. And you might decide to um, also help it with um, chlorhexidine uh, mouthwash as well. The point being, you need to remove the plaque, you need to remove the calculus, you need to control, you need to get hold of it and control it. Well, hope for your time and giving up your evening to listen to this um, important lecture. Thank you.